I'm Neoma Finn. Oh, wait. A quick update before I get started tonight. I've been working really hard and getting my ebook on Amazon, and it's been one account issue after another. I thought I'd have this done a month ago, and frankly, I've given up on it for now. I'm sorry for any inconvenience that may have caused some of you. Traditionally, Amazon requires a Mobi file, which I have. However, I read where they've changed their Kindles to be able to read EPUB files as well, which I also have. And if you know how to upload either of those files onto your Kindle or whatever reader you use, I will happily sell you a copy of it for $4.99, which is exactly what you would have paid on Amazon. All you have to do is send me an email at neomafin at gmail.com and put ebook in the subject line. Meanwhile, you can now purchase the book on Google Books or Google Play Books, and I've also got it up on a company called PayHip. I'll post both links in the description below. Oh, and I'm on Twitter now. <laughs> Thank you, Cameron Buckner. So if you want to follow me, by all means, please do. Okay, now for our story. Hey, I'm Neoma Finn. To quote Shakespeare, what's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Of course, this is a line delivered by Juliet as she argued that it didn't matter that she was a Capulet and Romeo was a Montague. Their love was just as great no matter who their families were. But I found myself pondering that question this week. What is in a name? Recently, I was researching the Chattawa Monster in Pike County, Mississippi. It's an interesting legend, even if it has a rather common origin story. I meant to do an entire video on the Chattawa Monster alone, but I came across a rather peculiar oddity, and that drove me down a rabbit hole, and, well, here we are. To begin with, let me explain the story of the Chattawa Monster. It seems there was this circus train. It was traveling along the Tangipahoa River. I hope that's how that's said. Tangipahoa? It was traveling along the Tangipahoa River in Chattawa Bottoms in Pike County, Mississippi, and carrying the usual array of strange animals when it suddenly jumped the tracks and crashed into the nearby woods. Most of the animals on that train were killed in the crash. However, a few monkeys and one especially interesting creature were said to have survived. The monkeys were quickly recaptured, most of them that is. I understand that they actually have captured wild monkeys in that area recently, or relatively recently. But that other thing, the grotesque half-man, half-ape oddity, that had been that circus's main attraction, was never found. It's said that the creature was so vicious that it had to be kept in its own railroad car inside a cage made of iron bars away from the other animals and any human beings. Extensive search parties combed the entire area, but it was as if the thing had been swallowed up by the swamps. Hopeful, glass-half-full members of the town of Chattawa suggested that perhaps it had died from injuries caused by the train wreck and that its remains had been picked apart by scavengers of the swamps. This theory was dashed when students of St. Mary's of the Pines School began reporting a strange, massive, hairy creature lurking at the edge of the swamps and watching them as they moved about the school grounds. These stories may very well have been the machinations of some crafty upperclassmen bent on putting a good scare into the hearts of their younger classmates, but they weren't the only ones. A woman tending her garden on the edge of town where the woods border the backyards of the properties looked up one morning to see a giant of a monster covered in hair leering at her from inside the tree line. Even the nuns who ran the school were less than comfortable with the idea of wandering into the nearby woods. A fairly reliable sighting came from a local law enforcement officer. He was off duty that day and working his farm. The sun had slipped beyond the western horizon, but there was still a dim glow of soft grays and lavenders in the sky. It was just dark enough that he had to turn the headlights on on his tractor. As he made his first sweep toward the edge of the field, those lights hit something that looked like a pair of eyes. An owl, he thought, considering how high off the ground they were. He figured as he approached the edge of the field that it would fly off and he'd get a good look at its silhouette against the evening sky. But it didn't fly away. 
The tractor moved closer, and the eyes appeared larger, and it didn't move. Is it eyes? he asked himself. Yes, it has to be. Soon the man found himself obsessed with the eyes in the tree line ahead of him. He figured he'd be right on top of them in a minute or two, and he'd know for sure what bird was sitting in that tree. But as he got closer, an outline appeared. This wasn't a bird. This wasn't even sitting in a tree. This was something eight feet tall and standing on two legs. Mesmerized by what he was seeing, he subconsciously slowed the tractor to a halt. It stood there for several minutes as the two were locked in a staring contest. It was deep enough into the woods that the man never got a clean view of it, but he saw enough to know that this thing had to be none other than the Chattawa Monster. Another Pike County story was told by a woman who had moved into the country with her husband and son. Coming from the city, the surrounding countryside, no matter how beautiful and peaceful it may have been, felt isolating and lonely to the woman and her son. The boy was a teenager who was used to having access to fast food restaurants and being able to walk to friends' houses a block away. He craved the harsh glow of streetlights over the soothing light of a full moon. To add to the boy's misery, he claimed the sounds he heard at night frightened him. The woman, unable to argue with her son's complaints because she was experiencing similar emotions, agreed to let him go live with his natural father several states away. The morning came when the boy was to leave. It was a long drive to the bus station, so they were all awake well before dawn. The woman kissed her son goodbye and went back to bed while her husband loaded the boy's bags into the truck and prepared for the drive across the frozen winter landscape. The woman wasn't there to see what happened next. She was at home, safely tucked into her warm bed. She could only report what was told to her by her husband when he returned, and later, by her son, when he called to let her know he'd arrived safely. As the father and stepson had driven through the barren winter landscape, they noticed someone standing in the road ahead. They were approaching a farm that had a huge eight-foot-tall sign at its entrance, and this man was standing next to the sign. Their first clue that this was not a man at all came when they realized he was at least as tall as, if not taller than, the sign. The beam of the headlights crawled up the massive frame to reveal a body completely covered in reddish-brown hair and a face not unlike a human's. It had long arms that reached nearly to its knees, and as they got even closer, it emanated a nasty odor that filled the truck. It never moved or ran away from them, even as they slowed to a crawl. They passed the creature and turned around at the next available spot so they could get a better look at it, but it was gone by the time they got back. I was enthralled by this story despite a few details that didn't make sense to me. The woman described a bitter winter cold not unlike what I grew up with in the Midwest. Admittedly, I've lived in the South long enough now that temperatures that drop into the upper 30s feel very much like the below zero temperatures of my youth, but I haven't experienced a freeze like the one she described. Those who live in the South will argue with me that it does get cold down here, to which I suggest they spend a few weeks in Duluth, Minnesota. Then we'll talk about cold. Even where I come from, the cold doesn't match that place. And Pike County, Mississippi is in the southern part of that state. So, as you can imagine, I was confused. I double-checked the facts of the woman's story, and I was surprised to learn that this woman lived in a different Pike County in a different state. Ugh! Of course it was cold there. She wasn't in Mississippi at all. She was in Ohio. Disgusted by the vagaries of the internet, I decided to turn to my personal library. If you've ever seen me on a live stream, you will know that my husband and I have a lot of books. Although his books are generally music-related biographies, mine tend to be about monsters and legends, strange events, and unexplained phenomena. Among my books is Sinister Swamps by Lyle Blackburn. Why I didn't turn to it first, I will never know. Among the swamps listed in this book, I found a brief chapter on Chattawa. In it, he recounts this chilling tale. A young married couple drove their truck down to the bottoms to enjoy some alone time in the cool of the evening. 
They parked on a lonely dirt road and turned on the radio before getting out and sitting on the tailgate to look at the moon and stars above. It was a beautiful evening, perfect for this sort of thing. Unfortunately, it didn't last for long. A massive storm blew in and they had to move quickly to get back into the truck before getting soaked. The rain was coming down so hard that they decided it would be better to wait it out than to risk sliding around in the mud and trying to see through the heavy downpour. In many ways, this was even cozier than before. The inside of the cab glowed with the light of the radio as rain hit the windshield, providing the baseline to the music that filled it. The two cuddled and talked and cuddled some more until the storm passed. Seeing a chance to make it home before another heavy rain rolled in, the young man turned the key to start the engine, only to discover that they'd used up the battery playing the radio. Afraid that more storms were on their way, they decided they would have to walk back to town. The moon was bright when it wasn't hidden behind a cloud, and the occasional lightning flashes in the distance helped a little, but other than that, they didn't have any light. The young man was carrying his twenty-two, though, so they felt reasonably safe. Besides, there wasn't anyone else for miles around. At least that's what they thought. They'd been walking for a while when they noticed someone standing in the road up ahead. They couldn't make out anything more than a silhouette, but from what they could see, it had to be a person. He was standing on two legs. Deciding to err on the side of caution, they slowed their pace to give themselves time to fully identify the man. It didn't take long to realize that if this was a man, he was incredibly tall, maybe eight to nine feet. They both began to feel as though something wasn't right. This is private property. You need to identify yourself, the young man called out. Whoever or whatever was out there didn't answer. The young man then pulled out his gun and fired around into the air. In response, the being standing in the road released a loud, terrifying scream. The young man panicked and emptied his gun at it. He never knew for sure if he hit it or if it was just the noise, but it began to thrash about and scream and roar louder. The couple didn't waste a second. They took off running through the woods. They ran four miles to town that night, never stopping once. They could hear the creature howling and tearing about in the woods somewhere behind them. The next day, they returned to the spot to get the truck. They found giant footprints where it had been standing, and they saw the evidence of the path it had taken through the woods behind them. But they never saw the creature again. Lyle Blackburn related a few really interesting stories about the Chattawa Bottoms in his book, Sinister Swamps. If you don't already own a copy, I highly recommend you pick one up. As fascinating as that book was, I couldn't stop wondering about the other Pike County. For some reason, I kept going back to the idea that it was strange to find two different counties in two different states, both with the same name and both having stories of Bigfoot or Bigfoot-like creature encounters. I had to turn back to the internet. This time, I typed in Monsters of Pike County. To my amazement, I discovered another one. Anyone who's a fan of mountain monsters will already know this one. I've never watched the show, but I have seen a few excerpts on an occasional episode. Even so, I was not expecting to find one called The Hellhound of Pike County. When it comes to television shows like this, I tend to treat them like walking on thin ice. As a general rule, no television show ever let the truth get in the way of a good story. I understand that completely. My channel is called Open to Doubt because I believe a good story is worth telling even if I can't prove it. My one rule of thumb is multiple sources. It wasn't easy to find with this one. Google Kentucky Hellhound and every source will bring you back to that show. In addition to Google, I did a thorough search of several of my books on Kentucky, including all four of Barton Nunley's books. I came up empty. Just as I was about to thrust the entire lead aside, I discovered an article on Mysterious Universe that confirmed that Hellhounds have been seen in Kentucky, and that was good enough for me. It was first seen in Pike County sometime in 1939. They said it was a ferocious black dog with glowing red eyes. It attacked the livestock first, then it began attacking pets. Finally, it turned its fury on the people of Pike County. Some say this comes straight from the Cushi, 
a mythological creature straight out of Celtic lore that I recently discussed in Arkansas's Full of Monsters. If that were the case, then its only purpose would be to take the souls of the dead into the afterlife. This creature, the Hellhound of Pike County, appears to be dedicated to creating dead for the afterlife. Either way, I'd advise anyone traveling through Pike County to be careful. So, time was running out before Saturday arrived, and I still didn't have my story written for this week. I needed to focus. So I pushed the Hellhound story aside and went back to the internet. This time, I tried Bigfoot sightings in Pike County. Okay, this was getting creepy. The Bucks County Courier Times in Leviton, Pennsylvania, reported a story in 2021 involving an incident that happened to a man and his girlfriend while camping in Pike County, Pennsylvania, in 1984. They were sleeping in their tent when they began to hear noises outside. He was sure it was moving around on two feet, though he never saw it. Since they were camping in such a remote spot, he couldn't imagine it being a human being. With no other options, the two lay in the tent listening and waiting. Eventually, the noises stopped. Had the creature moved away? Neither moved nor said a word for ten minutes. Then it screamed. It was the most terrifying thing the man had ever heard. It was right next to the tent, and the sound waves vibrated through him like knives. It lasted for nearly half a minute. It was too loud and lasted for too long for it to have been a human being. At the same time, he had no idea what kind of animal could make that kind of a noise. I have to admit, I was getting completely freaked out by the number of Pike counties I was finding. Then it suddenly occurred to me that Louisiana, Missouri is located in Pike County. Does that ring a bell? It should. The famous Momo the Missouri Monster is a Louisiana, Missouri legend. He stirred up quite a hornet's nest back in 1972 when he first appeared to two young boys and their sister. He was standing on the edge of the woods holding a dead dog. The kids described him as being seven feet tall with an oversized pumpkin-shaped head. They said he was covered in hair with so much of it on his head that his face was obscured except for two orange glowing eyes. They also said he smelled pretty bad, but I wonder if that was Momo or the dead dog he was carrying. After that, sightings became pretty regular for a while. People saw him all along the Mississippi and in many places to the west. Some didn't see him at all, but they smelled him or heard his inhuman growls and screams. A set of tracks were cast and submitted to Lawrence Curtis, who was the director of the Oklahoma City Zoo. He deemed them to be the tracks of some unknown primate. No one knows whatever became of Momo. At first, people were seeing him everywhere. Then, little by little, the sightings became fewer and farther between until people quit seeing him altogether. Perhaps he just got tired of the publicity. It seems strange to me that so many sightings of a variety of creatures have occurred in counties named Pike. It shouldn't, though. After all, we all know about the Taylors, Taylor, Texas, Taylor, Mississippi, and Taylor, Michigan. They're all hot spots for Dogman. Maybe monsters have a certain affinity for names. Or maybe it's just a coincidence. I didn't compare the names of other counties or towns to see if it happened with other names. I was running out of time. Maybe I'll do that in the coming week. Or maybe I'll go back to working on the story I started three weeks ago and still haven't finished. We'll see. I'm Neoma Finn.